Good morning, First Baptist Church at Tarpon Springs. What an amazing, beautiful day we have outside and inside. And you want to know why? You want to know why rain, shine, thunderstorms, floods, tsunamis. You want to know why it's a beautiful day? Because God created it. And his mercies are renewed every morning. And so no matter what's going on, no matter if you're sitting here soaked and wet, you can rejoice because God's mercies have been renewed. And you get to just bask in his goodness. You get to bask in his love and his greatness. And we get to worship together. And that's what makes it a great day. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So we got some announcements to make. Um, I'm a little fired up this morning, right? I uh, was able to lead ABF this morning, and um, I honestly felt like I was preaching more than teaching. I, mean, I think I'm a much better preacher than I am a teacher. I don't. Uh, I don't dialogue very well. Uh, I like to. Um, yeah, my wife would say I like to railroad conversations, and that's possibly true. Uh, but we. What a what a great time we had in ABF this morning. Uh, the attention level, the questions that were asked, the discussions that we had, uh, just, it was, it was great, and it really energized me, and uh, we're t- we started this week uh, talking about postmodernism, tolerance, new tolerance, intolerance, um, you know, all, all just the, the main uh, philosophy that's driving our culture today, we just had some really good top uh, conversations about uh, and I completely ran out of time. I got through about the first two paragraphs of our notes, realized we are in big trouble time-wise. And so uh, the grand poopaw of ABF scheduling graciously allowed me to uh, come back next week, actually, if you believe it or not, uh, and to conclude our study uh, or continue it and maybe move it on to a third week. I may have to throw myself on... Uh, the Grand Poopa's uh, mercy seat to get that done, but uh, we would love to have you back next week um, to to kind of soak and soak up and get overwhelmed. Really, it's it's a it's a fascinating study on uh, our our postmodern culture and what it means for truth, what it means for truth claims, uh, what it means for what it means to be tolerant. Uh, to be intolerant, and so uh, I invite you to come back next week for for that ABF class. Um, next week we have communion scheduled, uh, which is always just a, a, a very deep, uh, you know, very spiritual moment where we get to come together and we get to commune with each other. We get to commune with Christ through His death, burial, and uh, resurrection, and and the call that He gave us to remember His death until He comes. And so this week, be preparing yourself. Uh, for that throughout the week as we get ready to, to observe communion. And then Saturday, March 2nd, it's a little bit of a calendar change. Pastor Braden uh, texted me this morning. He says he wants to, to move our uh, evangelism event up by one week. And so Saturday, March 2nd at 1 o'clock, uh, we'll be gathering here for a time of prayer and then going out and meeting some of our community, those, uh, those neighboring the church, time to pray, and uh, so far... So, so on and so forth. So if you're available Saturday, March 2nd, um, we would love to have you here, okay? Uh, If you are new here, or it's been a while since you've been here, in front of you, in the pew, uh, back in front of you is our connection card. Serves a couple of different purposes. Number one, if you're a first-time guest with us, it allows us to know that you are here, and uh, we ask that you just give some information you feel comfortable sharing, uh, and, and that way we know that you're here and we can maybe reach out to you and just say, hey, thanks for being here. It meant a lot for you, uh, for us to have you here with us this morning. But also on the back side of that is a, is a prayer card slash praise card. So uh, if you're just carrying a burden and you're not exactly sure uh, what your next steps are or how to handle maybe the burden that you're carrying or a situation you're going through, but we would be honored uh, to be able to partner with you uh, in praying through that. And so you just, and it, it, those, that part of that card is completely confidential, okay? Uh, we don't post them on YouTube. We don't post them on the website. We don't post them on TikTok, Snap, uh, Instagram, <laughs> Discord, uh, you name it, whatever you want. We don't post those things. Those are kept very sacred. Those are kept in home. And we pray uh, throughout the weeks uh, for those that come in. And likewise, man, if you're just coming in this morning, 
And God just did something amazing. Did he just he worked a modern day miracle in a situation, and you're like, well, we would love to know that too. We would love to join you in praising God for uh, whatever he whatever he did, however he worked. We would just love to praise God uh, with you uh, along that. So, all right, having said all that, I think I covered everything. ABF, communion, evangelism, connect cards. We good? We're good. All right, let's move on to uh, a really important part of what we do, and that is the public reading of God's Word. And so if you're willing and able, would you please stand turn to Proverbs chapter 16. Your bulletin is wrong. I, do you need to fire the guy that does the bulletins? Because um, weekly, there's some sort of mistake, uh, some sort of typo. The guy's a joke. He needs to just uh, retire, find someone else. But we're going to be reading. Uh, it's me, by the way. I do it. Um, we're going to be reading Proverbs 16, 13 through 18, not 28. All right? So uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 13 through 18. Righteous lips are the delight of a king, and he loves him who speaks what is right. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, and a wise man will appease it. In light of a king's face, there is life, and his favors is like the clouds that bring upon the spring rain. How much better to get wisdom than gold. To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil, and whoever guards his way preserves his life. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we are entering into. We thank you that we are able to gather together and unapologetically read publicly your scriptures. We thank you for the wisdom that is found here. We thank you for the encouragement that is found here, for the challenges to our own lives that are found here in your word. God, we thank you for the time that we are getting ready to enter into and the fact that we get to sing publicly and unapologetically your praises. For you are a good God. You loved us, and while, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You call us, God, to a life of repentance. You call us to a life of change. You call us to a life of ministry. You call us to a life of of being your ambassadors to a world that so desperately needs to hear truth. And then, God, we look forward to the opportunities we will have this morning to, to sit together underneath the teaching of your word. And, God, may it be pleasing to you. May you be honored and glorified in all that we do here this morning. Because you are the reason that we gather. You are the reason that we celebrate. You are the reason that we sing that we fellowship. You are the reason, God, that we have life. And may these moments of offering and worship and sacrifice be something that glorifies you. We say these things in your name. Amen. Before our worship team comes up, we'd love for you to find a, a hand, familiar or unfamiliar, shake it, wish everyone a, just a wonderful morning.
everybody. If you'd like to take your seats and stand with us as we sing, All Creatures of Our God and King. Hold, please, for technical difficulties. 
opportunity to gather here and worship you and just sing songs and praise you and read your scripture, Lord. We ask that you be with us as we go out our, throughout our week, uh, as we go and preach your word and share your scripture, Lord. We ask that you go before us and prepare the hearts of the people. Thank you for the opportunity to get to share your word with them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our next song is called Blessed Assurance. Thank you. 
Good morning. There we go. Okay. Didn't work the first time. Now it's working. So we enter into our time of offering. We've used like all of the offering verses, so we're going to start just reusing them. All right. So we've probably done this one. This is probably the first one. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it begins with the word therefore. And one of my professors at Trinity College said, you know, would always ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? Well, the therefore means in light of everything else that we've looked at. So in light of the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, this is now where we pick up. This is what we do now. And it's, you know, so fitting that we just sang one of the most beautiful hymns. It is well with my soul. And it is well with our souls because Christ has made it to be well with our souls. And so now we have that begged question. What is the therefore? Therefore, what do we do now? And so Paul answers that question for us in Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We like to say, and it's listed here in your pamphlet, in the uh, order of the service, that we are now in the time of worshiping through giving. We worship through giving. And this giving that we do, it looks like a various of forms, various forms. That's why it's important that Paul says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is an oxymoronic statement. How can you be alive and a dead animal sacrificed to God at the same time? That's because every aspect of our life is meant to be now a living and holy sacrifice. So as we are in this time and as the men will, will pass the plates, uh, be that monetarily in your giving to the local church, uh, which is our home here. Uh, that is a, an act of service. But I would encourage all of us to not just be satisfied with, you know, putting a couple dollars in the plate if that is what you are led to do. But let us search our lives, how we may serve as, again, living holy sacrifices in every area, in every aspect of our life, be it, you know, a a attending here at the church and helping in other ways, in other physical ways, or if it's just throughout your life, how you may best offer your life as a sacrifice to God, living and acceptable because of what God has done. Not that we may earn grace or earn favor, but in the light of what Christ has done, let us love him and let us serve him. So let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for this time that we are able and privileged to gather together in your house uh, with your family, with our brothers and sisters, as we are bound to one another by the very blood of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that blessed blood of Christ, which saves us from our iniquities, cleanses us to be clean like snow, and makes us to be well in our soul. Lord God, I pray that as the men go, as they collect an offering, I pray that you would bless it and that you would bless how we would use it as your local church to reach our community, that we would love them, that we would share with them the light that you have given to us, that we would be salt and light in the world as Pastor Ross taught us this morning. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you. Amen.
Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you all uh, this morning as we continue our study in evangelism. But before we get into that, I do have to share something. And uh, we are in a little bit of a conundrum, uh, as I was just informed. Well, as Pastor, or Pastor Ross uh, announced this morning uh, that we changed the date for the prayer walk and the door-to-door evangelism event that we're doing um, to March 2nd. Well, then it was then brought to my attention that we had another event that we forgot about. And this event was an event that we care about deeply. It's the Walk for Life. That's with Oasis, Oasis Pregnancy Care Center. And so that's a big fundraiser. Many of you are going to be at that, um, that uh, would also want to go to our door-to-door event. So we're going to be trying to find a new date for that. We moved it from the 9th uh, because uh, Claire and I are going to be taking a vacation Um, And that was about the only time that we could set that up. Claire and I have not had a chance to actually go on a vacation by ourselves um, since our honeymoon. And we've been married for two and a half years. So I owe her. And so we're going to have to stay tuned for some dates. So we're probably going to push it past the 9th. So it could be the Saturday after that. I'm not going to say anything yet until I talk to everybody and their brother. It was not a typo on Ross. This time it was not Ross's fault. This was my fault. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I, uh, we're going to be, it's going to be after the 12th, essentially. It's going to be a Saturday. It's going to be after the 12th. I hope to do it in March. So stay tuned. <laughs> we will find an actual date that works for everything and all of the events that go on with this church. I'm so sorry for the confusion. But here's the good news is we're a family. We adapt. We move and we need to, right? Amen? Very good. So we've been studying evangelism. And in our study, we've talked about two things thus far. First, we talked about what is evangelism. We gave a good definition for it. We talked about what it is not as well, because that's so important to know uh, not only what something is, but also to know what it is not. And then last week, we talked about bridges and barriers. Bridges and barriers. In other words, we talked about Uh, Actually, it was the other way around, barriers and bridges. We talked about things that might stop us from doing evangelism. And some of those things were fear. Some of it was the thought of, they're all really rooted in fear, the thought of not knowing how to do it. And then it was then uh, maybe the fear of um, just the fear of people, right? I'm afraid to talk to people about these things because um, it might feel awkward. Well, uh, today I hope, and, and last week we talked about this, I hope you'd be inspired. We've shared many, many of Scripture where God's word tells us to share. We've also shared many a scripture where uh, God's, God's word tells us that Christ is with us as we go out on this mission. The Great Commission is Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, which talks about, it opens with, it says, uh, all, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. This is Christ speaking, not me. Um, I do not have that authority. Um, the, uh, and he says, this is, therefore, go. And so, We know that Christ has all the authority, amen? Therefore, we go. And so we're going to do that, and we're going to go, all right? And now this isn't going to be the only event we're going to do. There's going to be many events that we're going to do moving forward and and trying to do, be at least in prayer for our community and things like that. Um, What we're trying to do is create a culture of evangelism. If we just create a program, programs fizzle out, but cultures carry on. If we create a culture of evangelism within our church, then that will help sustain and keep our church and allow us to continue to reach this community. Something that I've been part of with churches where we just get into like flings of things. I've been in think, part of churches where someone will get fired up about something and we're into something for two to three months. And it only continues about that long until you know, someone loses interest, whether it be the pastors, you know, the people who put it together in the congregation, but there's certain things in churches where it just it becomes the culture of the church. And therefore, I want this to be the culture of our church that we are going to evangelize, that we are going to share. Amen? All right. Before I get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good. You are so merciful. You're so mighty. Everything you do has a reason. Lord, you have ordained it. God, we trust that you are good. We trust, that we trust your commands. We trust your guidance. God, help us develop a culture of evangelism within our church. Break our hearts 
for this community. Put your love for these people within us. God, burden us with them that we then would just be so compelled we have to go share. Or guide us in how we're to do it, when we're to do it. And Lord, today as we're going to talk about how we share your word, share your message and methods to doing that, I pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance. And that you would allow it to be imprinted onto our brains so that as we go out and we share any even encounter that we may have, God, that you would bring this knowledge forward in our brain so we'd be able to use these tools to put them in our toolbox, our toolbox of evangelism. God, you are so mighty. You're so wonderful. You are the king of glory. We follow your marching orders. By your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So today, we're talking about methods of evangelism. So how to actually share. Right? We've talked about what it is. We've talked about bridges to it to start a conversation. Okay, now this is the actual, okay, I'm actually going to share the gospel part. Right? Now, I know we're going deep into this, and a lot of this is going to seem like a lot. And you're going to be like, man, this is so much i got to know and have put together for, to have a gospel conversation. But I can tell you is this, is that I want to promise you, and always remind you something, we've talked about this before, you have something, if you are a believer, and you've trusted in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have something dwelling within you that will give you the words. That is the Holy Spirit. Right? As long as we're faithful, and we are in God's Word, and we trust in Him and Him alone, He will provide us what we need when we need it. Amen? All right. So methods to sharing. Something that we all need to have, any gospel presentation should contain, is at least four points. I've looked at a lot of different methods, and I've seen something common between them all. And it's these four methods, or sorry, four pieces. First, it has God, who's the creator. Next, it'll have something about man, which usually where it introduces sin. Next, it'll have Christ a message about the Savior, and then it'll have a response, which the response is faith. Let me go a little more deeper into this. So first, the gospel path, in other words, whenever we share the gospel, we should try to share these four things. First, we have a message about God. This is where we would then say that God is the creator of the universe and everything in it. This is something that someone must understand before they could ever understand the gospel. Something I would recommend, and I see some of you doing it, as I share some of these, we have these uh, PowerPoint slides up, take pictures of them, right? So that it also can help you if you miss something in writing it down. Um, it'll allow you to go back later and fill in your notes, okay? And, and so don't be afraid to take a picture of them. Also afterwards, if you need something, you missed something, you're like, hey, I didn't get this point, I would be more than happy to share it with you. So first, we have the message about God. We must have them understand the presupposition. In other words, they must presuppose, must understand first, this is first order, that God is real and he created everything. And that when he made everything, he made everything to be perfect. This goes right to the beginning of the Bible, right? Genesis 1-2, where it talks about the creation account, where God makes everything in seven days or six days, and then he rests on the seventh. Then, so that's the message about God. He is the creator. He made everything. Without this, we can't move forward. So bring that up, and then that's where you might get a response and see where someone says, well, I have a question about this or that or the other. And What I always want to try to get people to focus back on is this, is that God is the creator. Okay, People inherently know this. We're told this in Romans chapter 1 where it says that God has revealed himself in all creation. Now, some people, and this is actually going to be the minority of the people we're going to encounter, say, I don't believe in God. Right? The majority of people I have encountered believe in some God. Right? They're what we call agnostic. There's atheist, which claims they don't believe in a God, and then there is agnostic, which means they just believe that there is a God somewhere. Right? Atheist is no God. A means the, it's the nullifying uh, preface, uh, prefix. 
And then they have the, theism, which means God. So in other words, they don't believe in a God. But we know from Scripture that within their heart, they really do. Which is why I usually continue to say, well, I would argue and try to say that there is a God. And they might ask, they say, well, look at creation. That's another great example is to always point out creation. Look at God. Like, how did, do you think everything just appeared here out of dust? Do you think that somehow through random chance that you and I came about? I believe any really real rational person uh, will recognize that. Um, and so most people in an encounter will just believe in a God. That there's something, right? Which means they're, they're somewhat honest. Now, there's a problem with agnosticism that you know, I, I will share a little bit about, is that the agnostic, it's almost worse than an atheist, because an atheist says there is no God, which makes him a fool. An agnostic says that your God is not good enough to be my God. Which, to me, that's worse. To look at God in the face and say, you aren't good enough. What you have revealed, not good enough for me. My God that I have built in my own brain is better than you, which is what we're going to encounter the most. So we have that message about God. God is the creator. He made everything. Next, God made everything perfect. This is where we have just God making everything. This is then we're, then we're now going to be able to introduce man and sin. Next step, it's a message about man. God made man in his own image. Okay, What does that mean when we say that? Scripture uses it. Well, a lot of people have written a lot of books about what does that exactly mean, but I think the simplest way to say it is that we, he made them with a soul, and we are special to reflect him and his character. In other words, there are certain things about humans, about us, that we reflect God where other animals do not. Now, we see the fingerprints of the Creator on everything, but we are special. We are the only things made in his image. Now, he made us in his image, and we were in relationship with him in the garden. And then from the garden, we were given one rule, which we broke. And now they, you might ask, might want to share what that rule is. They were given a, they couldn't eat of, they can eat of any tree in the garden, any fruit of any vine. But they could not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? They couldn't eat of this. That was their one rule. And God said, if you do this, you will surely die. Well, guess what? Just like you or I would, and I always say that, because we would, we broke that rule. We broke that one rule, and it cursed the rest of humanity. Because we are all of the lineage of Adam, uh, we all now carry sin within us. It's called inherited sin. This brought sin into the world, this one transgression. Therefore, you and I are corrupted. And now, this would also be a good part to share, okay, this is what a sin is. Now, because we have this sin nature, we continue to sin. And a sin is anything that breaks God's law, anything that breaks his decree. That's important. And now, this is the 10,000-foot view, okay? 10,000-foot view. We're going to get into a little bit more of these specifics when people have more questions, specifically the one about sin. A lot of people will question if they're a sinner or not. I've had this discussion when I've shared. Um, usually it's younger people. Um, they will be like, well, you know, it's not that bad, right? Or I don't really know if it's that bad. Or what, what they'll try to do is they build this morality and they have these smaller things that aren't really that bad and they have these really big things that are really bad. So like, I can tell a lie, you know, I can commit adultery, I can do things like that. But murdering, that's like, that's no go. Like anyone that murders, Straight to hell, right? So when we're talking about sin, we do have to introduce and actually explain sometimes what sin is. And I'll give you some ways to help elaborate and explain on that. So we have the message about man. Well, man has broken God's law. That's sinning. And the punishment for sin is eternal punishment in a very real place called hell. Right? In other words, man is headed downward. Man is headed towards this place, eternal damnation, called hell, where God is only there to put his wrath on people who sin, people who end up here. But this is where the good news comes in, right? We share that God is real, then we share that man has made the image of God, we share some bad news, that hell is real too, and that you're on your way there. Then we have a message about Christ, 
or what is God's response to this fallenness? The message about Christ. In other words, God saw our predicament and sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who's both fully God and fully man, to come and live a perfect life, to fulfill the law, to fulfill what we could not, and then die for us. And after he died, he then rose again from the dead, proving who he was. That's the message about Christ. In other words, we have sin, okay? If we just tell people about sin only, right? If we just tell them about law, right? It's called law and gospel. We only tell them about law and how they're lost, and we leave them there. We're just going to leave them what? Discouraged, right? Paul talks about the law as almost a curse, but it's a good type of curse because it reveals sin within us. It reveals our need for a Savior. People must understand they need a Savior in order to come to Him. This passage came up in Adult Bible Fellowship this morning. Uh, thank you so much, Claire. Um, the, uh, the washing of the disciples' feet. This story in John chapter 13 that has been used uh, by a certain commercial during the Super Bowl um, that we might get into in a little bit. But uh, if you want to learn more about our stance on the uh, specifically the He Gets Us commercial, if any of you saw it, that's been buzzing on social media right now. I know most of you, if you didn't see it as a commercial for the Super Bowl, you probably saw it on Facebook. Um, if go listen to Adult Bible Fellowship. I believe Ross, Pastor Ross gives a wonderful response to that uh, commercial and that advertisement. But it misuses the, the washing of the disciples' feet. And Jesus, what he's doing in John 13, he washes the disciples' feet. He, he dons the, the, the towel of a slave because this was usually reserved for people who were the lowest in the house. He then goes to each disciple and he washes their feet, cleans their feet, which to us seems kind of weird. But to them, because they, most of them either walked around with sandals on or barefoot on very dirt, desert-like roads, their feet became very dirty, so when they got inside, you needed to wash your feet. So Jesus does this, and Peter sees him doing this, and Peter, who's always this outspoken person, he usually ends up putting his foot in his mouth, right? A lot of us relate to Peter. I like Peter. Um, he tells Jesus this, because he thinks that and I'm not going to let my Savior wash my feet. He says, no, Lord, you shall not touch my feet. You shall not wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. And then Jesus tells him, Peter, if I do not wash you, you will not be clean, and you cannot enter where I'm going. In other words, if you don't let me cleanse you, you will be unclean. Now, is he talking physically? No. He's talking spiritually. And what does Peter respond? He says, well, then, Lord, clean my whole body. Wash me entirely. Make me clean. Jesus was calling for that response. They, they must be open to receive this cleansing. This is just the same way in our evangelism. We're sharing. People must receive it with a humble heart. Right? It also gives us a little bit of a blueprint. Is, yes, we go share and we go serve, but as we do that, we must all at the same time share the ultimate service to people, which is forgiveness of sins. So we have the message about Christ. So he came, he fulfilled the law. Remember, law is important because we can't keep it. So he fulfills it in our place, and then he died in our place. He stands where you and I should be on the cross. Then he rose again three days later. Now you might ask, what's, some may ask, what's the purpose of the resurrection? We have tons of different explanations for that. But I think the one specifically for evangelism that I tend to focus on is, for one, we see that the resurrection showed Jesus' power over death. Jesus' example in his resurrection is to show what's going to happen to us one day. All who believe in Christ will be part of this resurrection. This is a resurrection at the end of time. Next. The resurrection also showed and proved who Jesus was. Who Jesus was. Jesus came and made a lot of claims. right? Now, if he made a claim that wasn't true, he's essentially a fraud throughout. So when Jesus said, I'm going to rise from the dead, I'm going to do something that no person has ever done in their own power alone, if he didn't do it, then he's a fraud. He's fake. 
But what did he do? He did it. He rose from the dead. And not only that, he says it says in 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to over 500 witnesses. So that's the message about Christ. We need to include perfect life, death, resurrection. Those three things, if you can cover those, that's a great, that is, that's the sum of his ministry. There's a lot more he did, right? I'm not saying that's all of his ministry, but if you got 10 seconds to say Jesus' ministry, it's, he came and lived a perfect life, he then died for sinners, and he rose again from the dead. Perfect. So that's the message about God, message about man, message about Christ, and then a message about a necessary response. Now, what is this response? Now, of course, we know that there is, everyone's going to respond to something. Saying, no, thank you, I don't want to hear about it is a response. Saying, yes, I want to learn more is a response. But the proper response to the gospel for one to receive salvation is faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. We see them go hand in hand in all of Scripture. We see this. We see example in Acts chapter 2. We see Peter Scher preaches the crucified Christ. Shares with the people there for Pentecost that they killed Jesus. That the blood is on their hands. That they are sinful. They've killed God essentially. What do they say? What do we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized. Now we know that baptism comes after one is saved. Baptism does not impart salvation on somebody. But when Peter says to repent, this word repent in the gospel implies that there is a changing of heart. Many of us, when we think of repent, and this is not necessarily an incorrect thing, it just might not be the whole thing. When we think of repent, we just think of a change of action. For the believer, repenting is a constant thing. Repenting is when we must turn from sins that we have within us and turn to the way that God would want us to walk. God convicts us of our sin. Perhaps he brings someone in your life who can expose it to you. And then yet, then you share with them. And then you turn back to Christ. This is called repenting. In other words, you're walking one way towards the way of the world, towards your sin. Repenting is then turning and walking back the way towards God. Now, repentance, this is not something, this is where some get caught up with repentance. They see it, and they think that it is something that, basically, if someone's not actively doing everything perfect, once they claim faith in Christ, it means that they're not saved. That's not necessarily true. People are still going to stumble. Paul talks about a thorn in his side. That's affecting him and his ability to do the gospel. Some theorize it could have been a physical disability. Some theorize it could have been a sin that constantly was lurking up within him. We're not going to be perfect, right? But we should always be striving to turn towards God and walk in His way. That's repentance. Repentance and faith. Change the way you're living and now follow Christ. That is the necessary response. Believe in Him. Believe in His death. Believe in His resurrection. So those are the four main things, big headings, that are included. A message about God, a message about man, a message about Christ, and a message about a necessary response. Right? That's why as we study Scripture, it is also still important to study the entirety of it. Because guess what? We don't get these, the first part of this unless we actually understand creation. We don't have a full grasp of the message of God unless we know the creation account. That's why we as believers should be in the Word studying it, and not just studying the New Testament, but also go back and look at the Old Testament too. We have this unfortunate uh, modern-day belief that we, the Old Testament has nothing for us, and I would say that's completely untrue. Old Testament has a lot for us. So make sure you're in your Word as well. That's going to help as you go evangelize. God will bring Scriptures forth in your heart. So that's like the gospel path that every method that I'm going to show you is going to kind of follow generally, right? Those four things are going to be in most evangelistic um, presentations, per se. So, I'm going to show you the next one, and all of you are going to know this one, right? Or at least most of you probably know this one if you grew up in America. Um, this one's called the Roman Road. Who here's heard of the Roman Road? 
Amen, right? A lot of people heard of the Roman road. Okay, some of you probably sitting in here, someone might have led you to Christ using this Scripture path. I would totally believe it. There's been so many people that probably know about the book of Romans because of this Roman road. Many gospel tracts use the Roman road. It's four verses. And I encourage you, if you if something that, uh, for one of the evangelism studies that I've done where I learned how to do some evangelism, uh, something we would do is we would have our Bibles, you'd have a highlighter, and you would have a pen, and what you'd do is you had different scriptures you were marching people through, and you would have written on the page, you would have highlighted that verse, and then you would have the page number of where the next verse is, and you would write the verse as well down as well. So you, as you're flipping through, you're able to get to those next scriptures. Maybe you want to do that for this. Maybe you mark these four verses in your Bible within somewhere on the page where the next one is. So you can flip to it nice and easily. Maybe you put a sticky note in there. Maybe you have some bookmarks or something like that. Maybe you decide to memorize all of these so that you might share them. So this one, uh, is, it's, it's amazing. It's a great one. I mean, personally, this is probably my favorite one if I just have to verbally share it with somebody or if I'm showing them using Scripture, because Scripture has power. I like to use this one. If you're going to say, hey, take me to some scriptures about salvation, I'm going to take you to the Roman road. So first, you have Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now you're saying, wait a minute, when you look at this, you might go, Braden, we're missing that presupposition about a message about God at first glance. Right now you see sin, right, and falling short. Wait, we've jumped a step. I'd say, wait, wait, read the whole verse, read the whole verse. For all have sinned and fall short, it doesn't end there, of the glory of God. So what you want to do first when sharing this, you first want to talk about God. This verse says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, first I want to tell you who God is. God is the creator of the universe. He made everything perfect, including you and me. But just like this verse says, we have sinned. We have fallen short of his glory, of his, of what he has decreed, of what he has said we shall do. We have fallen short of that. We haven't followed it like we should have. You want to talk about how the word, that word all is so important too for all. In other words, everyone has done this. This isn't some. This is all. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. Right. In the context of this passage, uh, Paul is talking about the difference between Jews and Gentiles and, and how there was in the Roman church you had these two groups that were kind of butting heads against each other. There was a decree where there was a lot of Jewish believers that had moved to Rome and there was a decree by one of the emperors that kicked them all out, removed them. And so they're all gone. All the Gentiles are then in the church and, and they're not practicing the, 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 the law like the Jewish believers were. Some of them f- still felt the need to carry on some of the festivals, some of the different things like that. These Gentile believers did not do that. They weren't used to that. Well, then eventually that decree goes away and they come back. Then you have this church that's butting heads. You have some that are saying, hey, we're more superior in here because we follow the law. Well, what Paul is telling is, no, no, everyone has broken the law. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your lineage is. You've still broken the law. And so what he's saying is this is everybody, Jew and Gentile. Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. This is the sin, this is sin and God, Romans 3.23. It's so important. And so the thing that you need the person to understand is that you are part of this all. You have fallen short of the glory of God. You personally have done this. Next to this, well, then you want to then you share, then what is the result of this? What is the result of this sin that you've committed? So after you go to Romans 3.23, then you take them to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Start, and you'd stop there. For the wages of sin is death. This death is not just a physical death. This death is a spiritual death. It's an eternity in a real place called hell. The wages, it's what's earned by sin. 
because of your sin, you're part of this all, what you've earned is death. This is the bad news. When I'm talking to people, I like to say, I have bad news, I got good news. First, I got to tell you the bad news so you'll know how good the good news is. You might talk a little bit more and go more into depth about what that sin is. Because they still might have questions. Well, I don't really know what sin is. Maybe you need to get specific on what you're going to talk about after this. That is the wage of their sin. It's death, the spiritual death. But there's a response of God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Say, but this is bad. Wages of sin. Sin is bad. But God is good. He offers something freely. Wow, this is so cool. Well, then it begs the question of, well, then how could God do this? How could he give this gift? Then you go to the next verse, Romans 5.8. It says this, But God shows his love for us in that while we, you and I, were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why do we have a free gift from God? Well, it's because of what Christ has done. That while we were bad, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What you'd explain is that we receive forgiveness of sins because Christ died in our place. I don't know if I would use this term, but I'm going to tell it to you all. It's called propitiation. In other words, he has died in your stead, satisfying God. That's why this eternal life can be offered. Now, when you share his death, you might even add more of this. He died and he rose again. And then now you say, well, that is the, we have that all have sinned. We then have the wages of sin, what it results from sin. And then we have God's response to sin, that sin is bad, but God offers free grace. And then finally, we then have the Romans 5, 8, which shows us that Christ died for us. What then is our response to Christ's death on the cross for us? Well, it's simply found in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the, one, and with the mouth one confesses and saved. This is the necessary response. Believe that Christ is Lord. This confess is not just saying, yeah, Christ is Lord. This confess is something that comes from deep within oneself. In other words, that when they say it, they're not just saying it. They're truly believing it with all their heart. A confession, this is what I believe. When a criminal gives a confession to the police, they are signing off that this is right and true what I have said to you. So when we are calling for a confession... We're saying only, the only way to receive this is to truly believe it within your heart. Just saying Christ is Lord will do nothing. Because what do we know from James? We know that even the demons believe and they shudder. So we must call them to believe that Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Two important things. And what's the result of that? You'll be saved. Means you will receive eternal life with God in his place where he is there to bless. That's the Roman road. Now, I've explained it a lot more to you all. If I'm sharing this with somebody, I would do it like this. First, I would take you this. Romans 3.20, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, God, which is the person that is, we're falling short of his glory, God is the creator of the universe. He made everything, including you and me. He made everything perfect, but the original person, Adam and Eve, you heard of them, right? Most people have. Did something, they broke God's law, and therefore now we all have a penalty to pay as well. And now we also still sin. For all have sinned and fall short. For all, all of us have done this. You too. That's the bad news. Even badder news is this. What does, what's the result of sin? For the wages of sin, the result of sin, 
is death. Now, this is not just any death. This is a spiritual death. This is a death where you're going to go to a very real place called hell. However, that's what sin offers. This is what God offers. It's the rest of this passage of Scripture here. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, through Christ, God offers eternal life. Eternal life where we get to be with him in a real place called heaven. How can God do this? Did he just snap his fingers and say to so? No, this is how he can do this. Roman, this is Romans 5, chapter, Romans 5, verse 8. It says, but God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, while we were lost, Christ died for us. And so God saves us by Christ, his one and only son, dying for us. Christ was sent to earth to live out a perfect life where you and I could not. He did not sin. And then he went and he died for you and I. And then he rose again on the third day. This was to prove who he was. So that while we were still sinners, he died for us. He died for you. Even though you're bad and you're separated from God, he died for you. But now there's a response to this that's required. Then I would read this verse. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, what does it mean to confess something? That's not just to say it out loud, right? Because I could say anything, but it doesn't mean I really believe it. To confess is to really believe this within your heart. And what are you going to believe? Believing that Jesus is Lord. In other words, he is your king now. And you believe in your heart that he died for you and that God raised him from the dead. It says if you truly believe these things, if you believe in him as king, you believe he died for you and you believe he rose from the dead, it says then you will be saved. And so you turn and you follow him as king and you trust in him and him alone. That is how you be saved. Would you like to believe that today? It's as simple as that. We can get even more simpler, which is where I want to show you a cool uh, gospel. Uh, actually, let me show you one other thing. When we people question, this happens a lot. Uh, people question about sin. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Brian, for me. This is what we call Ten Commandment Evangelism. Now, if you want to watch some more in-depth videos, there's a guy named Ray Comfort who talks about these. This is his style of evangelism. He uses the Roman road a bit. But then he also uses this style. What he does, he goes essentially to show people that they're sinners. He goes through the Ten Commandments with them and marches them through it. Now, I would just look up Ray Comfort, and you can find his videos. Right? I'm not going to go too far into this. Basically what he does, though, when people question, hey, I don't really think I'm that lost. I don't really understand what you mean by sin. Well, this is what God has said is correct. Well, do you do this? Is there no other gods before Yahweh or God? In other words, have you ever held anything above God? And they'd say, well, yeah, probably. Okay, you've broken that one. A graven image of God or any other God, have you fallen, followed that, right? Uh, that um, yeah, usually is a yes, right? Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Yes. Have you always remembered the Sabbath? You know, no, probably not. Have you ever disrespected your mom or dad? Yeah, right? Have you ever murdered somebody? They're like, oh, no, I've never done that. Well, then Jesus says that if you're angry with your brother or angry with somebody, you've murdered them in your heart. Have you done that? Oh, yeah, I've done that. I've committed a lot of murder. And it says you should not commit adultery. You ever, you ever done that? They're like, no, I've never cheated on my spouse. You ever looked at somebody with lust? Yeah, I probably have. That's, you've broken this. You ever stolen anything? Usually at some point in someone's life, they've stolen something. That's usually a, a yes, easy to convince. It says, you shall not bear false witness. Usually that one, we don't, you know, that one, of course, we were told a lie, essentially, is what that means. And it says, you should not cover. You ever looked at something somebody else had and said, man, I really want that? You can go through these. You can show somebody really quickly that they're lost. You say, these are sins. Have you broken any of these? They're going to go, yeah, according to that standard I have. Then you share about what Christ has done because of that and the forgiveness, and then the necessary response. You following? All right. I got one more thing to show you, then we're going to be wrapping up here. This is a, what they call an analogy. 
These are little gospel illustrations. And uh, what this is called is the bridge analogy. And now, why is it the bridge analogy? It's because you draw a bridge. What I like to do with this, and now you're going to see my graphic. I got a little overboard with the drawing of this. I got, I got kind of into it a little bit um, with, with, the, with my PowerPoint here. It, but it does not have to be this complicated. You don't have to be Picasso in order to draw this. Well, if you were Picasso, it would probably be you have the guy in pieces all over the, you know, those of you who understand who Picasso was. You don't, have to be, you don't have to be, you know, Leonardo or anything like that to draw this. What you can do, this is so easy, you can draw it on a napkin, right? You can draw it on your palm. I've seen people do that. I've seen some people, they carry on like a little whiteboard and they'll draw it on the whiteboard. Uh, any sort of piece of paper, you can draw this. So what it is, go to the first slide for me. You draw one side that has labeled man. Then you draw another side that's labeled God. And in the bottom, you have sin. And the whole point is that there's a gap between these two. There's a gap between man and there's a gap between God. And you have your little stick figure man on the side where man is to show that this is where man is. This is where we are. We are separated from God by sin. In other words, you'd say, this is you and me right here. We are, we are man. There's a gap, a chasm that we can't cross called sin that keeps us from God. Now, you'd explain who man is, who God is, what sin is. God is the creator. Sin is anything that breaks his law. You and I have broken his law, so therefore we're separated from him. There's a literal chasm between us. Then you would, I like to draw this every now and then, if you go to the next slide for me. We have different things that we try to bridge this gap with, that we think, we can get to God if I pray enough. Maybe I can get to God if, you know, if I go to church enough, if I have enough good enough church attendance. Maybe if I'm kind, if I'm nice to people, I can get to God. I can get across this chasm. Or, you know, maybe if I just do enough good things, I can get to God. I can cross this chasm. But what we see, I have little down arrows there. Those things, those bridges we try to build, they all fail. I always say that. Bridges we try to build fail. We don't cross this chasm. We can't make a way ourselves. But God made a way, and this is how he did it. So then you draw a cross, crossing the bridge, right? Now, I can tell you your crosses can get a little funny looking because if you have, like, the, you know, the, the chasm's really wide, you're going to have, like, a cross with a super wide, wide beam, right? Uh, but that's okay. I've seen some who draw the cross laying down sideways to try to fix that for the people who are OCD, Right. If you're me, I just edited the PowerPoint and made the chasm a little bit shorter. But um, so we have then this cross. What did God do in response to that? He sent His one and only Son, Christ. Now, who is Christ? Jesus Christ was God's Son, His one and only Son. He is both fully God and fully man. In other words, He is God Himself. He came down, He lived a perfect life, and He died on this cross. Or what, rep, what this represents, for sinners, for people like you and me. And then he rose again from the dead. This cross makes a bridge between the gap between us and God. In other words, this cross is the only bridge that crosses this gap. All other bridges fall short. They aren't long enough. The bridge that is long enough is the cross of Christ. But we must cross it. How do you cross this bridge? Well, we cross it by grace through faith. In other words, God's grace is what allows us to cross this bridge. It's a free gift. Faith is when we believe and trust in Christ and Christ alone to cross this bridge. In other words, we're saying, God, I can't get to you on my own. I cannot atone for my sins on my own. I can't overcome them on my own. God, I can't do any of it. It only is through your cross and your cross alone that this can be overcome. You put your faith in Him. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised Him from the dead. And then you'll be saved. That is how you cross this bridge. Then you have the next slide, which is that He's on the other side with God. Yay! This is my favorite analogy because it's so easy to draw. There's other ones, other illustrations. There's another one. You can go look it up on YouTube. It's called Three Circles Evangelism. It's pretty new. Um, relatively the last five years, it's kind of been developed. So we draw these three circles representing what we've talked about uh, and leading to them. Just look it up. Three circles, evangelism. But 
This one's my favorite because it's simple. Can you draw two rectangles and a cross and a stick man? That's, that's what it is. And maybe some arrows. You know, some of us, it's going to be like a, a, it could win a Nobel Prize or something. It's going to look so good. Your, your, your napkin drawing. But that's the bridge analogy. You always want to keep that in your back pocket. But finally, I want to remind you of one thing. This is always how the plane lands. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Believing and confessing that Jesus is Lord implies repentance. It implies turning towards him and following him because now he is your king. He is your Lord. Next is then also believing in your heart that he died for you and that God raised him from the dead. If you believe these things truly, you will be saved. It's as simple as that. Now some of you, and I'll talk about this very quickly if you have questions about it afterwards, you might say, well then should I do some sort of like sinner's prayer with them or something like that? I would say I tend to stay away from a sinner's prayer. And here's my only reasoning for that is that I just don't see it in Scripture. I don't see Paul telling people to get on your knees and pray this prayer, follow along with what I say. What I see Paul doing is saying, repent and follow. Believe in it in your heart. Now, I still pray with people. I might help guide them through a prayer where they thank God for saving them or something like that. Um, but the way that we want to that we want to encourage people to do this, the problem with the sinner's prayer is sometimes people say, well, I'm saved because I pray to prayer. No, I'm saved because I follow Christ. So, but our goal is to get them to follow Christ as Lord, for them to then believe it in their heart that he died for them and God raised him from the dead. That's how they'll be saved. That is how. So, we always have three points of application, right? Sometimes more. Well, guess what? These are going to look a little familiar. First, we're going to pray for your neighbors. This is, what, this is what I want you all to do. Pray for your neighbors Pray for the church's neighbors and pray for our boldness to share. In other words, that we would do what we've sought to do. These are our applications for this week. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, right now we lift up all of our neighbors, our personal neighbors, those who are beside us, next to us, who are in an apartment above us or below us. God, that they would come to know you and maybe through our sharing. God, we lift them up right now. Maybe they're desk neighbors to us at the workplace. Maybe we hang out with them. These are our neighbors. These are everyone we encounter. Where we also lift up the church's neighbors. In other words, the, all the houses around here, the people that dwell in them, that we would be able to then share your gospel with them. That is our prayer, that we would share with them. And then finally, Lord, that you would give us the boldness to share. God, that you would overcome our fears that you'd give us some knowledge as well, that as we go to share, you would give us the correct words to say and the right way to follow. Christ, you are so wonderful. You are so beautiful. By your Son's name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd love to invite the worship team back up to sing one of my favorite hymns, He Leadeth Me. And as we sing this and pay attention to the words, it's going to guide us to show us that Wherever we go, whatever we do, God has led us there. And by leading us there, he has shown us what we're to do. And this is why we can trust in this, is that he's led us there, so therefore we're there for a purpose. So if you all would, please stand with us as we sing, He Leadeth Me.
Church, just remember, wherever God brings you this week, remember something. Remember the words of that song that He led you there. He leadeth me. Right? So whoever you're around, that is a divine appointment. And who knows how God may want to use it. So be open to that. Be following to that. If you have any questions or if you need any prayer, I'll be down right here in the front. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May His face shine upon you. And may He be gracious to you. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.